be examining the lungs, and particularly or almost exclusively, we're going to be looking at mammalian lungs, and really, it's ours. So, aquatic organisms have had to adapt to a low oxygen environment and highly viscous respiratory medium. Terrestrial organisms don't have this problem, but we have another one. The exchange surfaces in the lungs have to be moist so that gases can quickly dissolve and cross the membrane, but water evaporates very rapidly in dry air, particularly when we're on cellular scale. This means respiratory organisms have to be internal. They need to be protected from the desiccating atmosphere, from the drying atmosphere, as well as being protected from physical and chemical damage, unless you choose to smoke, in which case more for you. However, this, in this increases the need for efficient exchange to ventilate these organs and to ventilate the other organs of the body. If your respiratory system is internal, the gas is outside. How do you get it in? And then how do you spread it around the body? That's the question that lungs have to answer. So, mechanisms of ventilation. Mechanisms for breathing and how do we regulate it? There are two mechanisms. The first is a pressure pump, where a mouthful of air is forced into the lungs. You can observe frogs doing this at times. That actual, that big frog, uh, that sort of bull neck that they get, and then they push it back in, that's them taking large gulps of air. Now that's a way of breathing. The other is a suction pump, where air is drawn into the lungs under negative pressure. That's how we work. So this is effectively where we have this, ma this massive muscle at the base of our um, thorax, at the base of our abdomen, called a diaphragm, when that diaphragm changes shape, there is a vacuum created around it. And the um, vacuum forces the lungs to fall, we open our mouths and we breathe. Sounds a bit ridiculous, but you actually, and well, in, on the surface, but if you keep your mouth closed and don't breathe through your nose, you actually can't move your diaphragm. Or if, if you can, because you're extraordinarily strong, you can only move it a very small way. So, we actually have a vacuum within our bodies, and if that vacuum gets punctured, so if something sharp penetrates through our rib cage and breaks that vacuum, or if something unusual happens that breaks the vacuum, like we might have some kind of internal damage, or in some cases it just happens spontaneous, that's called a collapsed lung. And it means that negative pressure has been lost. Carbon dioxide does not diffuse rapidly from the body to the external environment. Instead, it builds up in body tissue and lowers pH. So this is our regulate, regulatory system, which we've already talked about. So the external, uh, the, the carbon dioxide that we make during, respira during our cellular respiration doesn't actually get out of our bodies just from our muscles. It actually needs to be taken out of our bodies. So receptors that control ventilation, that control breathing rate, are sensitive to CO2 levels or pH. When either of these conditions pass certain tolerances, so here we have this tolerance word, this homeostasis link, then receptors send signals to increase the rate of ventilation. So we're exercising, we're exercising, and then our CO2 levels increase, the sensors pick that up, send signals to the rest of the body or to certain areas of the body, the, the lungs and the heart, and this increases our breathing rate while increasing our heart rate. Remember. We talked over our last lesson about that efficient exchange needing to have a link between the respiratory system, the breathing or the ventilation, and the pump and the um, method for moving that um, stuff around. The question here, what happens if too much oxygen is detected? If you've never had a panic attack or if you've never hyperventilated before, perhaps it's not immediately apparent to you, but again, we'll have that discussion later on. So here we just have our diagram. I'm going to refer to the diagrams that I've put up on the board. The bit that I have here is not the diaphragm, it's the heart. It's just to indicate how close the heart and the lungs are placed together. I haven't drawn the diagram in. I probably should have, but I haven't. But it's this big muscle that changes shape, so it contracts, gets smaller, the lungs fall in, the mouth opens, fill the lungs with air, and then the, uh, then the reverse happens. The diaphragm relaxes, pushes up against the lungs, we breathe out. This is how it happens. Now, the remarkable stuff is about how we can talk and how we can alter our diaphragm without even really thinking about it, but we'll leave that as it is. It's quite a simple system. It's just based on what happens when you have a closed system 
have you changed the shape of one of the vessels? And we can talk about that more in class. What I really want to focus on in detail is the alveoli. Now, the groups that we've got here, the bunches of these little spheres are alveoli. The individual that I've got up on the board is the alveolus. Now, what we have here, we have our single alveolus and it's just surrounded by lung tissue, by lung cells. Now, this is just a very zoomed in image. The blue around it is this mucosal layer, so it's just a liquid. It's mostly water. There might be a few amount, a little bit of proteins in there, I don't really know, but it's almost certainly all water and there's a, a little uh, addition to it in the surfactant so that we can actually have the membranes completely surrounded. We then have on the outside our blood vessel. Within that we have a single red blood cell. Now, each of these represents a barrier that the oxygen has to go across. So I'm just going to use black here to represent oxygen. So we've got our O2. Now, this is diffusion. So our O2 has to be, oops, wrong way around. It has to be high inside the alveolus. So we've just taken a big breath in. It's got to dissolve into the mucosal membrane. So it has to move here and then across the, the uh, lung or the alveolar wall. It has to then cross across the blood vessel wall and enter into the red blood cell. So there are four barriers that it needs to cross. Physical barriers. There are, well, if you, there's a video I think attached to this somewhere that uh, talks about a couple of others. We're most concerned about these four. So it's the mucosal membrane, or the mucosal barrier, sorry. It's the alveolar membrane, the blood vessel wall, the red blood cell membrane. So those are our four barriers that we need to get across. And this has to happen constantly, every heartbeat. This is happening millions, possibly hundreds of millions of times. This oxygen is penetrating into these red blood cells. It's attaching to hemoglobin, which we'll talk about later, so that it can spread around the rest of the body. And here we have our flow diagram. Deoxygenated blood coming up from the heart into the lungs. So this is our deoxygenated red blood cell. It gets oxygenated, so the oxygen moves across those four membranes. It then moves back as reoxygenated blood into the heart to be pushed out to the rest of the body. Every time the heart beats, this is happening. So every single heartbeat, blood is moving up from the heart into the lungs. It's deoxygenated uh, when it's in the heart. It gets reoxygenated. The heart beats again, pushes that oxygenated blood out of the lungs and back into the heart so that it can contract again and push the blood the rest of the way. Now for those of you keeping track, that's four separate heartbeats. One to fill the blood with de the heart with deoxygenated blood. The next to fill that, uh, to move that blood up into the lungs. Then to push the blood out and back into the heart and then push that blood out into the rest of the body. So there's four heartbeats for one blood cell. Now obviously, there's hundreds of millions of blood cells that are being pushed around at that point in time. But for each red blood cell, four heartbeats are required to move it from the heart back to the rest of the body. So it's an amazingly complex process because it's important to get it right. Now when we're looking specifically at mammalian exchange, we mammals are endotherms, it means we're warm-blooded. So we require a constant supply of oxygen to all cells. Interesting question there is why, but I'm going to leave that entirely alone for now. We're going to deal with that later. This requires respiratory organs that are extraordinarily efficient because we need a constant supply of oxygen. We also need a constant removal of carbon dioxide. A lot of this efficiency is achieved by our alveoli. The alveoli that have structures and functions to ensure very efficient exchange. Now, this sort of looking at our four exchange surfaces, our, our membrane, which is four things thick, this doesn't seem like a very efficient system, but it's as efficient as it can be, and we'll go through why. The alveoli, the plural, provide a massive surface area for exchange. We've got hundreds of thousands, probably millions of alveoli in each of our lungs, and we have two lungs, so that each breath, which contains I, can't, I think it's four liters of air, I'm guessing there though, but contains a certain volume of air, gets to as, is exposed to as much, as, um, as much of the blood as possible. So each of those tiny little alveoli, those microscopic alveoli, fill with fresh oxygen so that they can exchange that oxygen 
and get rid of the carbon dioxide that these blood vessels are carrying. The alveoli are lined with a single layer of epithelial cells. So this alveolar membrane is only one cell thick. It's also covered with a mucosal layer. So it's got this moist environment. So the barrier is as thin as it possibly can be. I've got a slight mistake there because it's not two cells thick. Because we have our alveolar membrane, then we have our blood vessel wall, and then we have our red blood cells. So it's actually three cells thick, but we're doing pretty well. And then lastly, the alveolar epithelial, oh, we've already talked about it, secretes a mucus uh, filled with a surfactant to keep the surface moist. Basically, the surfactant is like a very mild detergent. It just keeps it all the way around so we can kind of defy physics up here and stick that mucosal layer all the way around. So what have we got so far? Thinking back to our fixed law about rate of exchange. Well, we have a membrane that's incredibly permeable to the, uh, to the, sub the substance, to the gas. We have as thin a membrane as possible. We have a concentration gradient that's favorable, and that's mediated by this heart and lungs circuit. And we have a moist environment. So all of these things are working to our advantage to have very rapid exchange. Lungs are contained in the chest, the thorax, which is completely sealed and kept under a slight negative pressure by this pleural cavity. It's just a, a space between our rib cage and our lungs that's filled with very little. That's a virtual, that's a slight vacuum. The negative pressure keeps the lungs inflated. Losing this is what causes a pneumothorax or causes a collapsed lung. The base of the thorax is the diaphragm. This is a smooth muscle. Now that doesn't just mean that it's physically smooth, although it is. The smooth muscle is a type of muscle, which means it is ordinarily under involuntary control. So we don't think about when we're breathing. We can stop breathing and we can modify our breathing. So the smooth muscle made up in the diaphragm is a slightly unusual type of smooth muscle. That's not part of this course though. But it's a smooth muscle, so we don't have to think about it in order to control our breathing. We can just let our brains or let the diaphragm do its own thing. When we're looking at mammals, uh, mammals use negative pressure generated by the diaphragm contracting and the rib cage lifting. So the diaphragm contracts, it gets smaller, it becomes sort of slightly bell shaped. The rib cage lifts up, so we actually uh, contract some muscles in our chest to expand, and then we inhale. This is, a this is why the mechanism is regarded as a suction pump, because it's actually sucking the air in. Exhalation is caused by relaxing of the diaphragm and rib, ca rib cage, and this reduces the volume of the lungs pushing air out. Forceful exhalation we can cause by further compressing the rib cage. So we can actually push the rib cage smaller to push more air out. You can kind of feel yourself doing that when you've got a sentence that's too long. You can feel your body sort of push down so that you can get more and more air out because you're really running out. So transporting gases, we've got three slides to go. The respiratory system of animals supply oxygen to the body and circulatory systems by blood, move the gases to where they are needed. So the lungs get oxygen to the body, the circulatory system is actually what carries that oxygen around or carries the carbon dioxide around. Within blood, there are oxygen-carrying proteins that contain a metal, typically it's copper or iron. Uh, there's a, a group of um, horseshoe crabs that have blue blood that's driven by their copper in their blood, and they're very often colored. They're often called respiratory pigments because of this coloration. These pigments increase oxygen-carrying capacity for the blood massively, and importantly, the bonding of oxygen to these molecules, to these uh, proteins or pigments, is reversible it's driven by diffusion. High concentration of oxygen in the cells means that we're going to push oxygen out. In mammals, this pigment is called hemoglobin, and it is found mostly in red blood cells. We've got some questions and key terms there. So hemoglobin, if we shorthand it to HB, carries oxygen around the body by combining with O2 molecules, as we'll show on the next slide, or on that slide. So at high O2 concentrations, the capillary surrounding the so for example in the capillary surrounding the alveoli, hemoglobin combines with oxygen and forms oxyhemoglobin. At low O2 concentrations, that is in exercising muscles, oxyhemoglobin loses its oxygen to become hemoglobin again. So it's a concentration gradient thing that we've got happening. At rest, hemoglobin is almost 100% saturated. So while you're sitting watching your videos now, unless you're you know doing some exercise while you're doing it, which you know more more power to you if you are, 
Um, and it's normally 75% in other body tissues. So only 25% of the oxygen in oxyhemoglobin is used for cellular respiration in normal circumstances. And this leaves a reserve of 75%. The reserve is critical for healthy body function. It protects against sudden increases in demand. So if you surprise your body by doing something terrible like exercising without warning it, O2 saturation can drop as low as 25%. What this means, now that's obviously O2 saturation in, in the hemoglobin in the muscle tissues. So what that means is that that 75% gives us a bit of a buffer. Here we've got our difference and you can see here when we have oxygen bound it looks quite tight. When we release oxygen it's opened up. So that binding of oxygen actually changes the shape of the protein. Uh, we're going to do our fucking liver dissections at some point possibly in this week in week four or maybe in week five depending on time. Thank you once again, Year 11s. Please remember taking notes, asking questions.